for those going on the youth mission trip this summer. So that meeting is still on for here after church today. This week is also food pantry week. So uh, truck delivery Tuesday, 930-ish. Those of you that help with that, we never know exactly when the truck will get here, but somewhere around 930. And then distribution on Wednesday, beginning around 5. Uh, those of you that volunteer and help with that, <clears throat> uh, be here around 430 if you can. If you haven't helped before and you want to, you're welcome. Okay, Come on, we can all use some more help. Uh, next Sunday, we will have a church-wide fellowship meal uh, to send off uh, David and Vicki Creel off the mission field. They're headed out, no, not to Atala, but to Cambodia, <laughs> so long way away. So we're going to have just a covered dish meal and, and uh, uh, next, uh, next Sunday after church to, as a send-off for them. And also, uh, well, Mark will tell you more about that later. So that's next week, next Sunday, okay? Also, uh, remember, uh, announcements have been up here and email and stuff. A couple of baby showers coming up. Uh, we got two more at the end of this month. September 25th, Marianne Hayes. Well, you know, what's the last name? But, yeah, yeah, right. And then Sunday the 26th, the next day, Tori Lee, uh, baby shower there. Times and locations and gift register, all kind of stuff is on the website. So you can go and take a look there. Uh, week from Wednesday is Ash Wednesday service at 6 o'clock. Not this week, a week from Wednesday, Ash Wednesday service, okay? All right, one more thing. Had a bunch of folks that came yesterday and helped sort of start clearing out some stuff and packing some things, that kind of business. And first of all, we appreciate all of you, uh, those of you that came and helped. Appreciate that very much. Had a good crowd and got a lot done. Uh, in connection with that, <clears throat> these two rooms right out this door, the, what was a prayer room is now a donation room. There's a bunch of stuff in there that, that, uh, that's available if you'd like it. You can go and grab it. And you can even leave a donation for church if you want to. But if not, if you see something you like in that room and you want to take it, some, you, can, you can get it. Okay? The room next to it, that's stuff that's sort of more for sale. Okay? So if you want to go in and see if there's something there that you want to buy, just get with Kat and she'll help you out on that. Okay? Kat, where are you at? Is that it? I get it? Okay. Good deal. All right. Uh, let's see. I think that's it. Sharon, you got ministry moment. Come on up. Um, I wanted to give a little bit of an update on the food pantry ministry. I don't know if we have any visitors here. If, if we do, my name's Sharon, and I'm kind of coordinator for our food pantry ministry. I wanted to give you a little bit of background on our, uh, how this all got started and then let you know where we are now. In 2008, one of our youth, Alex Harwell, who's the son of Don and, Donnie and Diane, and by the way, happy birthday, Diane. She's going to shoot me, but anyway. Uh, Alex was working on his Eagle Scout badge, and he needed a, a project to accomplish his honor. He felt the need for those in our community that needed food, so he started a food pantry, and it was started out as a cabinet. Uh, I think John Minton, am I correct? John Minton was the one that helped him build it, and it, we stocked it with just canned food and people that needed it, that came to the church that needed it. Uh, could just go in there and get get food and what was needed and that was how it got started I'm not sure of the date but around 2015 Lexi Hembry arranged a partnership with the Community Food Bank in Birmingham where we were able to purchase food at a much lower cost we began to open our doors to those in need on the third Wednesday of each month in March of, two, of 2020 a new coordinator was needing needed and I was asked to consider taking it on? My first answer was no. Uh, I didn't want to do it. I knew what was involved, and I didn't want to do it. But at that time, our middle son, Kevin, was the associate pastor, and he looked at me and said, but mom, you moms know what that means. You say, okay. And he said, you know, we got to keep this going. At the time, we didn't know, but the pandemic was just beginning. And we had no idea what, this, what was going to happen to this ministry during that time. However, God chose that time to grow it. At that point during the pandemic, extra federal funds were made available to us through the food bank, and we were able to partner with Ty and Tanisha Dillon and their church 
which at that time was known as the Living Truth Ministries and met at the old College Heights Baptist Church. They're now known as the People's Place and meet at um, the venue each Sunday. We were able to serve around 300 people each month in our community and in the East Gaston community. And this lasted about a year. To this day, uh, even though we don't do that part anymore, uh, Ty and Tanisha still take part and come and help us, and they've also given financially. We have continued the ministry to this present day. We serve anywhere from 120 to 150 people each month. We never know how many. <laughs> If I cut it back, they come. If I do too many, we don't do enough. You know, I mean, it's just, it's just, you just never know. But we provide a bag of groceries and some form of meat for each client. Each month is different and the numbers vary, but we feel God sends us to the ones that need our help for that month. This Christmas, with your generosity, we provided 160 holiday boxes from the food bank, which contain canned and dry items for several meals, as well as a frozen whole chicken. Also, with your donated items, Barbara Kajavi spent many, many hours making gifts for each family unit. And then also recently, Honey Baked Ham donated 15 large hams for our clients that they had left over. And I'm not talking about little bitty hams, I'm talking about big ones. We've also brought our Brown Bag Buddies ministry under the Food Pantry ministry. Joy Hayes is kind of in charge of that, and it's where we pack lunches for students that need it for the weekends. Uh, we provide 30 children at John Jones Elementary a weekend sack of food once a month. We would like to expand this to either more children in that school and maybe even to another school in the future, so that's something we're looking forward to. You may ask how I can get involved. There are several ways. Prayer, number one, especially on the third week of the month, that God will send to us the ones that need us, and we will be attuned to not only their physical needs, but their spiritual ones as well. Number two, any financial support is appreciated, though we do ask that your donations be above your tithes to the church, because we still need your tithes to go to paying light bills and stuff. Number three, the truck from the food bank usually arrives on the third Tuesday of each month around 9.30 a.m., Sometimes, like this month and next month, it will be the second Tuesday if the third Wednesday is the first. So it's confusing, but normally it's the third Tuesday of the month. We always can use help in unloading the truck and filling the bags, and it usually only takes about an hour and a half. We've got, it, we've got a system going. The distribution is at 5 p.m. on the third Wednesday. You'll need to be here around 4.30, and we're usually finished by 6 p.m. This allows Wednesday night folks to eat and then come back for Bible study at 6.30. If you know someone who is in need, please tell them about our ministry. Lastly, as we move, many, of us, many people have asked me about our ministry. As of now, we will hope to continue as we are and pray for our clients who will come to us at the new location and others will be added. There are many things to be worked out and we will keep you informed as we go along. However, as God leads us, we will continue to do ministry in our community, wherever we are. It may look a little different. It may not be as big. I don't know right now. But I do know that, that God has called us to do this, and we're going to do it. We have our distribution next week. We're going to do one in March, the, third, uh, the 15th of March. We are not going to do one in April because that will be right smack in the middle of, of the move. And we'll just have to keep you involved and, and informed as far as when we pick it back up after we kind of get the dust settled and see what goes on. But just know that your, um, your donations, your prayers, and everything is appreciated, and uh, we will continue to do ministry. Thank you. Okay, are they gone? They're gone. Okay, good. Listen, Vicki and David are running off to Cambodia, and we would like to do a love offering for them. So this first time the ushers are going around, this is for a love offering for Vicki and David to take with them to Cambodia. And I know some of you might not be ready for that right now, but if you're not ready for it right now and you do want to give something to it, then sometime during the week you could uh, drop something off 
with Marty. Um, you could do it online and indicate what it's for. You could give it to Allison so that she can make sure that they get it. Okay? I don't want to take the opportunity away from you. Or you could just bring it next Sunday, too, and, and give it in the offering that Sunday, and we'll, we'll check it before the end of the luncheon. Okay? But um, this first time they're going around, this is for a love offering for Vicki and David as they run off to Cambodia and do mission. Yes, take your time, please. Can you play us something, Deborah? This one's for ties and gifts, okay? <laughs> one another. I, I do have one more announcement that I want to talk to you about. The trustees, if you're a trustee, we're going to meet at two o'clock this afternoon. And just for one purpose, to go over the contracts for the sale of this church and the purchase of the other one. Okay. So trustees, if you got time today, two o'clock, please come and join us. Please take the time to greet one another. All right, if you would please stand with us. If you're not already standing, let's uh, worship the Lord with, uh, through song today. All right? I've got a river of life.
recognize that wound. All my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm gonna sing where. from 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 9. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, meaning infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants, through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will be each rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. Let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, while we are flawed and very human, you are perfect and truly God. In this time of transition for our church family, guide our thoughts and actions to be like you and open our hearts to the wisdom of your word. In your name we pray. Amen. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me all my days. I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God Yes. 
Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. He makes a way where there ain't no way. Rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can't save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Jesus. Are you as emotional as I am? I mean, I, I really, the, lately, the things that we've been through, I'm just like broken all the time, seems like. 
Not that I mind because it just makes me remember to turn to God and ask for some help. Um, so all morning I've been walking around going, Lord, I need your help. Lord, I need your help. Lord, I need your help. Oh, you too, huh? Okay, just checking. You know, <laughs> never know, never know. Um, we do have a lot of things going on. Uh, I want to talk to you this morning about the things that Jesus said. It's really what I want to talk to you about. Um, you've heard it said, but, uh, but I say, and this is coming from Matthew 1, 5, 21 through 27. It's still part of the Sermon on the Mount. We've been there for a little while. And, and Jesus, at this point, he really just states the laws, demands, quite strictly. And um, even to the point where he condemns even minor infractions. But the same Jesus invites and welcomes all the sinners, too. And ultimately even dies for all of us. And the, and the fact that death couldn't hold him means that he is the one. He's the one we can put our deepest trust in. Let's take a moment and pray together, would you? Oh Lord, just give us wise, self-controlled, patient, understanding, Devout, faithful, courageous hearts. Fill our souls with devotion to your service and, and strength against all the temptations that can just surround us. Uh, when the storms are raging around us like they are now, Lord, we, we know we can always run to you for rest. Uh, in, in, in the turbulent times and in the trials and in the temptations, in weakness or in fear, there's no doubt that you are our strength. Your hiding place is, is always secure, Lord. We can always come and you'll embrace us and hold us in that safe place. You've shown us that, that falling is not always failing. You pick us up and rescue us when, when we're overwhelmed. You are the Lord of hosts, a tower of strength for us. We have no other place to turn, Lord. No shelter in which we can hide but you. And this morning and always, we just depend on you, Lord. It is in your holy name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So like I said, Matthew 5, 21 through 37, you have heard that it was said to the men of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be guilty before the court. But I say to you that everyone who continues to be angry with his brother or harbors malice against him shall be guilty before the court. And whoever speaks contemptuously and insultingly to his brother, Raka, or you empty-headed idiot, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court, that is the St. Hadrian. And whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of the fiery hell. So if you are presenting your offering at the altar and while there you remember that your brother has something such as a grievance or a legitimate complaint against you, leave your offering there at the altar and go. First make peace with your brother and then come and present your offering. Come to terms quickly at the earliest opportunity with your opponent at law while you are with him on the way to the court so that your opponent doesn't hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you're thrown into prison. I assure you and most solemnly say to you, you will not come out of there until you have paid the last cent. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who so much as looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye makes you stumble and leads you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. That is, remove yourself from the source of temptation. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble and leads you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. That is, remove yourself from the source of temptation. 
For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has also been said, whoever divorces his wife is to give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife, except on grounds of sexual morality, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who has been divorced commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to the men of old, you shall not make false vows, but you shall fulfill your vows to the Lord as a religious duty. But I say to you, do not make an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head for You are not able to make a single hair white or black. But let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Meaning, make it a firm yes or a firm no. Anything more than that comes from the evil one. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Man, that's tough. He got tough, didn't he? Basically saying, if you even think about it, guess what, guys? You've already done it. Wow, you got tough to do. Jesus comes across this morning almost like a hardline preacher of the law. You know, today from the Sermon on the Mount, it seems like he's hellfire and brimstone. You know? If we really pay attention to what he's saying, I'm sure it can make us uncomfortable because he speaks against things that we all do. Right? He, he condemns anger and resentment against other people, quarreling, uncontrolled sexual desire, disruption of marriages, lying, and worse, all the games that we play with the truth. He condemns all of those things. All of, of those are against God's law, he says, and, and all can lead to judgment and condemnation. But it doesn't really end there, does it? See, if, if we keep reading beyond today's text, we'd, we'd hear Jesus speaking against retaliation for in, injuries. We'd hear him telling us to love our enemies as well as we love our friends. We'd hear those things too. We usually think of Moses as the Bible's lawgiver, but, but Jesus digs even a little deeper than Moses did, doesn't he? And he denounces wrong thoughts, desires, actions, all of those things. The Bible tells us that that Moses sins. And and John quotes Jesus as saying this, Which of you convicts me of sin? You remember reading it, don't you? People see him the same way that a healthy person is a reminder to people who neglect their health. The righteousness of Jesus is a reminder to of the sins that sinners have. And it makes us uncomfortable to hear it. You know, we, we really don't want to hear this. We, we know that these words of Jesus kind of zero in on who we really are. They go right down to our personalities, deep into our souls. They unmask our pretense of righteousness, you know, revealing the the sinners behind the masks, don't they? We like to skim lightly over these verses and get something less demanding. But the thing is, the thing is we'll never get better if that's what we do. We'll never be healed if that's what we do, if we don't just take it to heart. And I'm telling you, the little things matter. The times we're angry. There are times when we say things that we just shouldn't say to other people. Those little things, they matter. Say, say it's like this. You, you find a lump in your body that wasn't there a couple of weeks ago. It, it could be, well, well, you know what it could be, right? You could be taking the time to put it off, not go to the doctor so you won't hear that C word, right? 
Or, or you could look for someone who will tell you, oh, don't worry about it, everything's going to be just fine. In the same way, I, I, I can tell you, you can find churches where the message is always positive and nobody ever talks about sin. And the only time they really do talk about sin and when it, is when it's somebody else's sin. They never talk about their own. For heaven's sake, that would just mess a church up, wouldn't it? You know? Or maybe they talk about, you know, things that aren't really sin, but things we got to do a little bit better. Oh, you got to give a little bit better. Oh, you got to serve a little bit better, right? It's not like it's a new phenomenon. Okay. 2,700 years ago, the prophet Isaiah described this reaction when people heard his message. Do not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy illusions. Sin is like a cancer. It, that goes deeper than the actions that other people can see. It, it, it does this thing. It infects our hearts, our minds, our fears, our desires. Even infects our fantasies. They become so embedded in who we are that we have even a hard time seeing that they're in our lives. We don't realize we're even doing it. We get so used to it. See, sin, in part, is the way we picture ourselves as righteous. Right? Even at the expense of others. Or maybe I could say it's the games that we play with lies to make them seem true. Right? We go in a direction opposite to God's, which could easily lead to, to our final separation from God. Jesus calls it the fiery hell. That's what he calls it. it this is tough to hear. It's a hard pill to swallow, isn't it? It is something that we need to hear. But we don't just need to hear it. We need to take it in. Understand that we're the ones he's talking to. It's us. Hmm. See, we miss the point if we try to dress it up with sweet words. And I am an encouraging guy. I want you to always hear sweet words. But I can't neglect the truth at the same time. Otherwise, I'm not leading you well at all. The reaction of many Christians to this may be to say, well, all right, I guess it's good to be reminded of the Ten Commandments, but I don't kill people or sleep with other people's spouses or steal from my neighbors, and I speak the truth as accurately as I can. You know? Why does Jesus have to call attention to these little picky union infractions of the rules? Why does he have to lay my heart open? Expose my soul. Does it really hurt anyone if I get a little heated in an argument with my neighbor or have a fantasy about a relationship with my coworker? Little things matter. They lead to bigger things. Probably most of you have had the experience of deciding that you need to clean up some area where you live or work or might be your apartment or office or the kitchen or maybe even the garage, which I just did recently, by the way, clean out my garage. And then I took everything out of my office and put it in my garage. <laughs> I thought, well, that didn't work. <laughs> whatever, it wa whatever it was, uh, you probably realized at some point that things had gotten a little out of hand and a little scattered. Important papers got mixed up with ones that should have been recycled. And, and there are these odd items that that someday we just think we might need. So those things go into the miscellaneous folder or the drawer or the closet or the garage, you know. If we're not careful, the clutter, it'll get out of hand on us. That's how people become hoarders. The clutter gets out of hand. There, there's a scientific principle called the law of increasing disorder. 
uh, the principle is that the total disorder in the universe is always growing. Chaos is always growing. Uh, and, and we know that living things need some degree of order. It's necessary for their lives. So life, in general, is a continual struggle against disorder. We're always trying to get it lined out and done right and fixed up, and, and we never actually get it all done, do we? We just get up the next day and try something else to get it, you know. <laughs> Happens just that way. Spiritual life is a continual struggle against spiritual disorder, too. We have to keep our mind and our eyes and our hearts and our actions on it all the time. If we're uncomfortable using some, uh, uh, I said that wrong. Let's use the word uncomfortable. If we're uncomfortable, no, let's use the word comfortable. If we're comfortable using some relatively mild insults with people who disagree with us, the habit can grow. And and when it grows, we could get to the point where we find ourselves using dehumanizing words towards other people and their customs. It might only be just this short path from there to committing a hate crime, to doing something tragic. Little things matter. We have to be careful not to let them overtake us. Jesus laid down the law in, the, in, in that part of the sermon. Now, a few chapters later, we hear him say um, a quite different kind of message. He says, come to me all who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. It sounds almost like we got two different Jesuses talking here, doesn't it? But let's not forget He's talking to the same people. These are the same people he just got really tough with that he is being really kind to. You know, we heard the unqualified demands of the law and then we heard him offer release and relief and say, I will give you rest. And as we read through the Gospels, we're struck by the fact that Jesus, who can be so strict of a teacher of the law, it seems to just be often associated with sinners. Right? That's who he's hanging with. In the setting of the Gospels, the close contact to the Jewish tax collectors had to have, uh, they had to have this this connection with the Gentiles that made it difficult to, for them to follow the Mosaic laws. They were, they were widely seen as dishonest. Nevertheless, Jesus called Matthew, didn't he? To follow him, to be a disciple. And he followed him. And then, of course, what was the big problem? He was always having dinner with tax collectors and sinners. You know, the scribes and the Pharisees, uh, morality pr police, let's call them that. It's about what they were sometimes. Were offended by his behavior and his friends in low places. And they demanded to know, why does he eat with people like that? But Jesus said, we have to be more righteous than his critics. And his response to them was, I've come to heal the sick, not those who think they're already healthy. Yes, I took a little leeway in there. Think they're already healthy. Jesus' mission is to save people who have failed to keep the law, which when you come right down to it means what? Me, you, right? Everyone. What does the scripture say? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. As Paul wrote, you know. 
And as we read through the Gospels, we see Jesus moving inevitably toward the cross for us. He will be condemned as a lawbreaker of the law and rejected as the one who is unrighteous, accepting the consequences of our human sin. The death sentence upon lawbreakers is carried out upon the one who actually gave us the law. God becomes a participant in each one of our stories. Not as a judge, not as an executioner, but he's on our side. Taking our place, paying our penalty for our own sin. Of course, we know that that isn't the end of the story either. We know on the third day he rose from the dead and proclaimed, peace be with you. To all his discouraged and fearful disciples. And I think sometimes it's how we feel discouraged and fearful. Peace be with you. The penalty for sin has been paid. And our fellowship with God has been restored. See, that's the way the message has often been presented. And it is true. It is true that way. But there is more to it than that. If we stop there, something essential gets missed. What Jesus Christ has done by his life and death and resurrection is more than this legal transaction between him and God. By proclaiming God's love for us through the sharing of our life and dying our death, he has shown us that God is indeed to be trusted above all things. And if there's a message that we all need to hear this morning, God is to be trusted above all things. He will work our way through all of these things. I am confident that he will. That doesn't mean along the way I'm not going to get broken or mad or, you know, because it's going to happen. And I'm going to be on my knees again. I imagine I'm probably not the only one. See, and it's that faith and trust in God that is the true restoration of our relationship with the Creator, is knowing He is there for us now and always, all the time. Now, as we go through all these difficult decisions and situations that we're experiencing today, we must continue to place our trust more and more on our Father God and on our Savior Jesus, allowing the Holy Spirit to guide our words, our attitudes, and our actions. I pray you're able to glean something from that this morning. Now stand with us. See through this chorus. Majesty. Worship is majesty. Unto guys but I'll hold it try to hold it together for a couple more minutes all right um, there is something that I want to say and I think the I think the kids and the youth are in here aren't they they are the most important part of our congregation Amen. they are our future I am broken for them and so pray for them pray we find somebody that can give them the love, 
that can give him the guidance that Laura gave. Please. I pray for you when I pray for me. I hope God's with you everywhere, every moment. And he is, I know. That doesn't stop the tears from flowing or the nose from crying. But I know he is. May that be so. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.